Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. My name is Ty with Mojo Plays, and today we're looking at why video games are too expensive. Is your hobby leaving you short on change? We got him, we got him! Everybody, give it! Before we begin, we publish new content all week long, so be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Along with the release of the Xbox Series XS and PlayStation 5 in 2020, came the revelation that the price of video games was going to increase to $70. The trend began with 2K games and has now spread to become a new industry standard for AAA titles moving forward. The main reason given by video game publishers and news outlets for this price hike is inflation. Video games haven't risen from $60 in 15 years, and in that time they've gotten bigger, better, and most importantly, more costly. I bet they're scouting us. But the inflation argument doesn't really hold water. While it's true that video games are getting much more expensive to make in general, and particularly the AAA blockbusters that now boast this higher price tag, something else has been growing too. The number of players. Private Allen, you'll be taking orders from me from now on. I'll brief you on the chopper, let's go. In early 2021, there were an estimated 2.8 billion gamers in the world, which is more than a third of the planet's entire population. It's true that when adjusted for inflation, a brand new game today for a PS5 will cost far less than a brand new game for the NES in the 1980s, but the market was far smaller back then. Remember when N64 games were going for $80 to $100? Yeesh, I do not miss those days. Watch it. Watch the tape. Then tell me I'm wrong. Only 62 million NES consoles were ever sold, and while this is a lot, it's a long way off of 2.8 billion. Video games are now a billion dollar industry, with games at the $60 price point making their entire budget several times over. In 2020, the entire Call of Duty franchise broke $3 billion in total revenue following the release of Cold War. Call of Duty is one of the most lucrative video game franchises in existence, and one of the first to adopt the $70 price tag. If Call of Duty was already making hundreds of millions of dollars each year, generating vast profits, why has Activision decided to bump up the price? Do those profits not already cover the cost of growing development, or is the money going somewhere else? Hey, Dave, which one is it? Is it the one on the left or the right? <laughs> Well, the money is not going to the developers themselves who are hard at work making a new Call of Duty each year, despite this being the implication when publishers talk about ballooning development costs. You don't look so good. I don't feel too good neither. In fact, the developers at Activision Blizzard in particular made headlines in 2020 for being so underpaid they had to skip meals to afford rent. They anonymously shared their salary information to work out just how much they were being undervalued, all while the company's CEO, Bobby Kotick, found his name on numerous lists of the most overpaid CEOs in the world, and took home a $200 million bonus in 2021. Red Dead Redemption 2 had a development budget of between $170 million and $240 million, meaning that in one year's time, Kotick took home roughly the entire development budget of one of the most expensive games ever made, while Activision also laid off employees yet again despite record growth. There was money on that boat, all right. So yes, video games are getting more expensive to make, but because of a push toward photorealism and big open worlds from AAA publishers and developers, but the developers at the biggest, most lucrative companies aren't seeing a share of the profits, and nor is the development budget itself. But it's fair enough to say lots of the most expensive AAA games from the likes of Rockstar, EA, and Activision Blizzard are worth those $70 and more. Red Dead Redemption 2, for instance, is outstanding in a lot of ways. But what about all those AAA games that decidedly are not worth $70 and weren't even worth $60 on last generation hardware? Little advice. 
treat your game with respect. Rockstar's parent company, Take-Two Interactive, claims the public is ready for $70 games, but we should really be asking the publishers if they are ready for $70 games. Over the last several years, the industry has seen a glut of incredibly expensive flops, like Marvel's Avengers from Square Enix, Anthem from EA, and Fallout 76 from Bethesda. Happy Reclamation Day! Now go get them! AAA was once a term that assured a level of quality from the companies producing these games, and many early AAA games, like Final Fantasy VII, have gone on to be some of the most popular and critically acclaimed titles ever made. But today, the term is almost meaningless. Many of these so-called AAA games are disasters. It seems like it's actually a lot rarer today for a AAA game to leave a big impression compared to an indie one. Well, assuming that the game isn't from a first-party developer. Indies, however, like Hades or Disco Elysium, are enjoying a surge of popularity and acclaim. I'm pleased to have you as a friend as well, Charon. The pleasure's mine. While the likes of Assassin's Creed and Call of Duty will repackage the exact same game year on year and then sell it to you again for a higher and higher price. AAA has even been described by the people who work in it, like Ubisoft's Alex Hutchinson, as an unsustainable and toxic business model that only enforces crunch. This problem was even acknowledged by former PlayStation executive Sean Layden, who, after leaving Sony, suggested the industry re-examine its budgets and development. Give me a hand over here! All AAA means now is that a game costs a ludicrous amount of money to make and will be expensive as soon as it hits shelves. Until it comes out, you won't have a clue if it will be worth your hard-earned cash. And of course, the attempts of AAA companies to convince you to spend your money don't end when you buy the game from a store digitally. Instead, many of these very same blockbuster games are full to bursting with post-launch monetization. Microtransactions are inescapable in this price range and completely unjustifiable. And again, these profits don't go to the developers, they go to the pockets of games industry executives, and they don't provide you with anything of real value either. A new cosmetic might look cool, but it's almost certainly not worth paying for. Hi hi, nice to meet you. Seriously, do character skins have to cost $20? And yet, after all of that, it's still not true that every aspect of game development has been increasing in the last few decades. In fact, many parts of game development have gotten significantly cheaper, namely the manufacturing costs of physical games, so much so that you might find yourself getting charged more for a digital version that has absolutely zero manufacturing costs versus buying a physical copy. Remember, they got rid of instruction manuals. Remember how cool those were? They don't have to worry about those costs anymore. In contrast, physical games in the 80s and 90s were significantly more expensive to make, necessitating high costs and with no alternative distribution chain. But the growing digital market has no real competition if you're locked into buying digitally. If you own a PS5 and want to buy a digital game, you have to buy that game from the PlayStation Store through Sony, which leaves Sony free to charge however much it wants. We have no choice. With the push towards all digital consoles, this problem is only going to get worse. People simply won't be able to buy a physical game at all. For a given Sony exclusive, Sony might own not only the console you use, the game, and the development studio, but also the digital storefront itself. Vertical integration like this has been a big problem in the past. Hollywood studios once owned not only the movies and the stars, but also the theaters themselves. And the problem was so severe that the system had to be broken up by the United States Supreme Court. Here I thought your kind was supposed to be so enlightened, so much better than us, so much smarter. Suffice it to say, Sony is increasing its prices to $70 simply because it can, and people don't have any other choice than to pay up when they want to play the next blockbuster Sony exclusive. 
and no matter how good Sony exclusives generally are, this practice is still bad for consumers. Ultimately, games are so expensive right now because video game publishers decide that's how much they should cost regardless of how much evidence there is that the developers themselves aren't being paid fairly, the games aren't anywhere near as expensive to make as they seem compared with their profits, and that many AAA games are only worth a fraction of their retail price. Did he hear you? Notice how so many AAA games these days go on sale less than a week after they launch. I'm looking at you, Immortals Phoenix Rising, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Cyberpunk even, and folks, that is why video games are too expensive. As we head into the new generation of gaming, please be smarter with your money, research games before you buy, don't just watch the trailer, and support the studios that take care of their employees. In the mood for more awesome gaming content? Be sure to check out this video here on Mojo Plays. And don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.